Welcome to Your Family's Health. This is Joan Buckley from the Department of Nursing here at Nassau Community College. Your Family's Health is a program that focuses on the health care issues and the resources available to you here in Nassau County. On the show, we speak to experts from around the country to keep you up to date on current health care issues and trends. And today we're going to be speaking to Patrick McKeown, and he's a well-known author and a spokesman, and he's an Irishman. Um, and he has a new book out called Oxygen Advantage. So if you want to know more about how to stay healthy here in Nassau County, stay tuned for the next no, next half hour to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. So welcome to the show, Patrick McGowan. Um, Thanks very much, John. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here. This is the perfect time of year for this because everybody's an athlete. I notice in my neighborhood, everybody's starting to jog more frequently. Mm -hmm. Everybody's golfing again. So this is like really not just seasonal in in any way, shape or form. But I think this is a great time of year to talk about oxygenation. But first, I want the listening audience to know a little bit about you and how this became a passion of yours that has taken you to more than one book. I mean, this is not the only book you've written, but this is your latest one, Oxygen Advantage. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's, I came across by accident um, all the way through my childhood into my teenage years. I would have had chronic health problems, so I had asthma, which was getting worse, um, even despite taking more and more medication. You know, I was constantly wheezing. I was caught, caught for breath. And I was also told that I was stopping breathing during sleep. So I didn't realize at the time, but it's a condition called obstructive sleep apnea. And that was causing me then to be tired during the day. So I was tired in school, so it was difficult to concentrate. And at the time, I often felt that my stress levels too were greater than what they should have been. Um, so there was a lot going on. And it was in 1997, I heard, heard of the work of a Russian doctor. And he said two things. He said, breathe less. And he said, breathe through your nose. So I first used this exercise to decongest my nose and I switched from mouth breathing to nose breathing and um, within a week it's completely changed my life and it, it kept continuing, you know, that the progress once I adopted the new way of breathing or basically reversed the bad habit of what I was doing, mouth breathing, um, you know, it stayed with me, the benefit stayed with me. So I qualified in a completely different field. I have an MA from one of the universities here in Ireland. And uh, I decided to to leave the corporate world. And I wanted to work in this field, you know, and to bring breathing um, into, into Ireland. And more specifically, to bring it based on nose breathing, both in and out, and breathing light. So that's how it ha- stopped. That's how it all started. Um, and it's lovely work, you know, really, it's a great passion. I've been doing it for 15 years now, and it's it's great to see the changes that we're, we're getting with it, um, you know, across a number of different health complaints and sports, of course. You know, I'm trying to breathe through my nose now while, while I'm listening to you, and I have a cold, <laughs> so but I'm trying sure. to breathe in and out through my nose. But I'm telling you, um, as a nurse... We kind of teach people yoga breathing, and I know there's a difference because that's mm-hmm. take a deep breath and it doesn't focus on, oh, maybe it does go in through your nose and then you kind of breathe out. But what's the difference between, um, first of all, what I love about this is it's free. It's, a, it's something that you can learn, and sure. I know it's not immediate, the responses, but you can learn it. And what's the difference between this and yoga breathing? Because everybody knows yoga. Yoga's been around. Sure. This is kind of new for me. So I'm assuming it's new for a couple of people. Um, yoga breathing, when it was discovered and adopted in the Eastern world, would have been very close to what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but yoga breathing, it's almost as if the message has been passed down to telephone wires. And in doing so, the message has, has got a little bit uh, mis- mistranslated. You know, the, the whole aspect of human beings... If if we breathe more than what we need, or if we go around with our mouth open, there's less oxygen getting delivered to the cells. You know, there was uh, the basic law, in effect, discovered back in 1904. Four, it's called the Bohr effect. And it states that for oxygen to be released from the red blood cells to the cells to power the body, um, carbon dioxide needs to be present. But yet there's this kind of idea that bring in as much oxygen as you can and get rid of as much carbon dioxide as you can. And that's not true, you know. That's, that idea is widespread in the Western world. 
take the deep breaths, take the big breaths, but uh, taking the big breath isn't going to add any more oxygen to the blood and it's not going to cause any more oxygen to be delivered to the, the, the tissues. Um, you know, like, it's, uh, over-breathing is, is a habit that has become widespread due to factors of modern living, but also, of course, disbelief of the benefits of taking a big breath. And all somebody has to do is take take 10 big breaths in and out of your mouth and see how does your head feel. And many people feel dizzy. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, if you sleep with your mouth wide open, many people wake up very tired. You know, so the harder you breathe, breathing shouldn't be hard. And if we were to go back to the ancient yoga that was taught in the Eastern world, they use one word and they use subtle. They say that breathing shouldn't be hard and that breathing should be very light. And I've looked at other quotations like, your breathing should be so smooth that the fine hairs, the cilia within the nostrils do not move. Um, you know, there's three stages of breathing. Another quotation that the person next to you should never hear your breathing. You shouldn't hear your breathing. And uh, your breathing should be effortless that you do not feel your breathing. So when we look at the ancient text, there's nothing in it about taking these big breaths. Um, and human beings, I think it's just our nature. You know, we often think bigger is better, but unfortunately it's not the case for breathing. People who are on fish and people who are unhealthy have big breathing. They get breathless during physical exercise very easy. They snore and they breathe heavy during sleep. They're often breathing using their upper chest, using their mouth. And uh, I think it's time to go back to basics. And that's really, you know, what the exercises are, is, is to... to teach the individual how to decongest the nose, how to switch to nose breathing, and how to change their breathing patterns so that they feel better oxygenated. And, you know, with three to four minutes of practicing it, and yeah. all it's doing is literally slowing down the breath, completely slowing it down to the point that you feel that you're not getting enough air. Body temperature is influenced, so body temperature will increase. Hands get warmer. There's increased watery saliva in the mouth, which is activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so the physiological changes one can experience pretty quickly. You know, you said you, you had asthma as a child, and that this must have been difficult for you when you were having um, an exacerbation of your asthma because you, you're, mm-hmm. you're almost trying to get more air in, and, and one would assume yeah. then that, you know, you're sitting forward, the kids, you know, there's nasal flaring and there's all that. Um, yes. When you started, were you? Were, I know sometimes children outgrow asthma, um, and uh-huh. you've been doing this for 15 years. And yes. I'm assuming then you were a young adult when you started yeah, trying I was to. Within 25 years of age and the, around. Okay, I didn't want to ask how old you are. But um, was it really monumental for you to have the control over your asthma that you didn't have as a child? Because it is, it gets uncontrollable because of many reasons with kids. Um, you know, their activity, sure. their unpredictable behavior sometimes. But did you find that it really changed your asthma? Did it eliminate your asthma? It it completely changed my life. Um, um, absolutely. There's no, it was probably the best thing that I had ever learned ever in my life. Um, it served in a number of fronts because my energy levels went up. My My sleep got better. My concentration improved. My stress levels reduced. Now, I'm not saying that this is a cure-all. Of course, yeah. it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if you breathe using the nose, in and out through the nose, you will tend to activate the diaphragm. You also carry a gas called nitric oxide from the nasal cavity into the lungs, and nitric oxide sterilizes the air. Nitric oxide is also a bronchodilator, so it opens up the airways. So people with asthma, kids and adults with asthma, invariably are going around with their mouths open. You yeah, know, because yeah. they're caught for breath. And it's so well documented. You know, if you take dry air in through your mouth, you're going to cause moisture to be sucked out of the airways, and that's going to cause inflammation of the, of the airways. And the upper airways and the lower airways are linked. It's one unifying model. So many people with asthma also suffer from nasal congestion. And if you have nasal congestion, then it adversely affects your sleep. Mm-hmm. And then people with asthma have two to three times the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So again, all of this is really well documented in the research. And we've had 16 clinical trials with this with asthma, and every single one of them have been positive. Now, how, um, young, how so, young is the youngest person that you've been using for clinical trials? Because a lot of times they try um, to stay away from kids, but this seems like that's the perfect uh, population to start in. 
Well, it was two two clinical trials I was involved with. Uh-huh. Uh, it took place at the university in Brazil, and there were kids attending um, uh, patient outpatients for asthma. So there were children between six and twelve years of age. Wow. Now, it because it, it's, it's very very simple exercises, you know, and there's no side effects. Um, teaching somebody to breathe through the nose and decongest the nose. There is no side effect. So the risk in terms of, it's not like, say, a pharmaceutical intervention. If it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, if breathing exercise go wrong, well, you know, oh well, it, there's no side effects. So yeah. the biggest thing that can be lost is, is time. But, you know, even following the breath is very good for the mind. You know, so the, the, really, how should we be breathing? People... I often use the comparison with stress. Um, during stress, our breathing gets faster. We breathe more. We sigh more. We breathe using the open mouth. And uh, we take more air into our body. And then we're told to take a deep breath. And a deep breath is generally taking this big breath, faster breath. And all it's going to do is exacerbate the stressed breathing. So to counteract stress, we, we need to do the complete opposite to how the breath goes during stress. Emotions affect our breathing, but also our breathing affects our emotions. And it's been well documented that if you slow down your breath, if you completely slow down the breath, you will activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Stanford um, Medical School just released a new study as well about a month ago, looking at the connection between the state of anxiety and our breathing. So it's very interesting to see that mainstream medical schools, especially Stanford, are starting to explore this field. But our sleep doctors, Dr. Christian Gimeno, who discovered obstructive sleep apnea, he's talking about the importance of nose breathing for pediatrics, and he's going as far as saying that the only valid and complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing is to restore nose breathing, both during the day and during sleep. Now, we have to consider that I've studied children, 50% are mouth breathers, and there's a huge connection between mouth breathing and poorer academic performance, speech issues, and um, poorer dental health, and craniofacial changes that are associated with mouth breathing during childhood. So this is simple information, Joan, that's, you know, I think it really needs to get out to the masses um, because it's giving people the, the tools to help themselves. And then with athletes, like athletes, they don't have perfect breathing either. Many of them that I've worked with, you know, of course, they're, they're prone to stress, they're if they're a part-time athletes, they're going to be sitting down at desks. They're talking maybe excessively, depending on their jobs. Right. So they develop poor breathing habits too. So all we're doing is getting back to basics here. Switching to nose breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, and light breathing. And then, of course, with athletes, though, we have exercise to simulate high-altitude training. Um, it's where we purposely alter breathing to lower blood oxygen saturation. So we can simulate a height of... Um, about four to 5,000 metres, which is about 12, say, to 15,000 feet. Wow, you know, this is the perfect time for the break. I, I've been breathing through my nose the whole time. I just want you to know you're listening to uh, Your Family's Health on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. This is Joan Buckley and Patrick McKillen, and we've been talking about oxygenating of a healthy body and his new book we're going to talk about after the break oxygen advantage so stay tuned this is namdi asamoah i play football for the philadelphia eagles but what i do off the field with united way might be more important i'm a volunteer tutor and mentor why because over a million kids a year drop out of school and that's not okay it takes 12 years to create a graduate but it takes about the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between a child becoming one or the other could be me, or it could be you. Studies show that if we get to these kids earlier, their chances are better, and kids who read well by third grade are more likely to graduate. So join me and United Way. Suit up and take the pledge. Become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor, because when a child succeeds, we all succeed. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Take the pledge at unitedway.org. Brought to you by United Way, the Ad Council, and the National Football League. WHPC. Welcome back to your family's health. This is Joan Buckley and Patrick McKeon, and we've been talking about um, Oxygen Advantage, and that's his new book. But really-